What's up today guys? I'm doing some training for the neonatal outreach program through our local simulation center. Now, with the outreach program, we do training for rural hospitals in their emergency departments, specifically for those high acuity, low volume situations where a mom comes in and she delivers and there's possibly problems with the delivery and problems with the neonate, so they have to do resuscitation. So there's multiple aspects to this, but this section is going to be about taking care of the airway. Positive pressure ventilation is super important. So, what'd you say? Oh, is it time? Cut to the intro. So I'm back here in the neonatal resuscitation room and I want to give you a quick rundown of what the table looks like over here of the equipment that we have available uh, for an at-risk delivery. So let's get over there and take a look. So this is the table we set up for our neonatal resuscitative simulation and I'll just go real quickly over this and then talk specifically more about some of the respiratory items. So epinephrine over here, 1 to 10,000 solution. We have some stopcocks and some 5 ml syringes, some syringes with saline. We also have a 500 bag of normal saline. Uh, we're going this way. We have two different sizes of Ambu masks that will adapt to our T-piece resuscitator. We have three sizes of endotracheal tubes. So endotracheal tubes, the sizes we have are 2.5 and you can see that there, if I can get it to focus. So uh, 2.5 ET2. Uh, next size up, we have a 3.0. Refers to the inner diameter of it. And the last one is a 3.5. Inside this 3.5, I had a stylet. So you can see a marked difference in the length of these endotracheal tubes. Um, with the 2.0, 2.5, uh, sorry, the 2.5, the 3.0 and the 3.5 here. Optimally, we'd like to have at least a 3 or a 3.5 in a, in, a, in a neonate. And term neonate, 3.5 would be the best is if we could get that in there. Now, you'll notice that these endotracheal tubes are a little different than the adult versions because, one, for one, there's no cuff on them. So they're cuffless endotracheal tubes. These are made to actually seal inside the airway. So they will go actually in and they'll seal into place. You will have a minor amount of leak and that's absolutely okay, but they will seal in and there's no cuff that will seal it off. So another thing that you'll really run into, it's very easy for your endotracheal tube to migrate uh, on your patients. So uh, we'll really secure those airways. I'll show you some, some tricks for that too. And then you also have the lines on here and these are really vocal cord lines is how we use them. So you just pass, put these past the vocal cords, just barely past the vocal cords, and you know you're in the right spot. Generically, on a chest x-ray, we're looking below the clavicles and above the carina. But, you know, on, a, on, on a, even a term neonate, it's only a space about that big. So you're not dealing with that much space. Uh, I have a stylet, too. Of course, it's a um, rigid, uh, semi-rigid stylet, so it can be moved and manipulated. Um, it's usually an intubation person, a therapist, physician, or whoever's intubating. It's their preference if they want to use a stylet. It does give a little more rigidity to the natracheal tube, especially uh, if it's been under the warmer. And I'll show you that in a second too. But uh, if it's under the warmer, it gets really floppy. And you try to stick it in between some cords, and it just wants to just kind of not go in because it's so floppy. So that's something to look at, look at with the stylet. On the next part here, uh, just a standard, this is a uh, LED handle, uh, of course it has a light inside the handle. You can check it that way to make sure the batteries are appropriate just by pressing down. You could also put the blade on and turn it on, you can see it's working there. So um, we usually just do it and test it before you, before you go to the resuscitation or before the resuscitation starts just to make sure this works. The nice thing is about these handles, you don't have to open up the blade. You can just hit this button and you can see that it turns on and when it turns on, you know, the light works. So, see the light working there. So for the blades, these are all Miller blades, which Miller blade is a, is a straight blade. Um, we have a Miller 1, a Miller 0. 
So um, the, of course, zero is smaller than a one. And then we have a double zero. Now this double zero actually isn't made for this handle, but we have it here just for just to show the three sizes of blades. So you can see the size difference in these. Uh, so we have the blades, you can see the size difference. Of course, that's the one, the zero, and then the double zero right here. Um, this is, double zeros are fine to use, but uh, usually you can do almost everything that you can do with a double zero with a zero because it's all gonna be based upon how far you insert this in. So you just don't bury it all the way in there. You're gonna have to insert it a smaller amount and make it work more like a double zero. So a zero is usually what you're looking for, um, a zero or a one. Like I said, with a one, a one's pretty big for a neonate, so it's gonna go down there pretty far, but um, you're just gonna use the front even third of it. So you're not gonna use the whole, the whole blade. Bulb, bulb suction. We also have these as part of our neonatal resuscitative kit. Uh, this is a, a neonatal LMA. So it's called an air cue. This would be used in a situation that we couldn't get into tracheal tube in and we could insert one of these and it would um, essentially go down as a little, um, it's almost like the same version of this. So like a little ambu bag uh, mask but it's gonna fit right over top of the glottis. So this slides in, this would be work for ventilation. Not perfect, couldn't go on a vent with it, but it could work for resuscitation. Um, we have a lot of these, and uh, you'd only use it in a, in a situation like maybe like a Piero bean or something like that with something with a, uh, a baby that has some kind of small jaw or recessed lower jaw that might be really difficult to intubate. Um, in my career, I've seen a lot of kids intubated, intubated quite a few myself. Uh, neonates and, and not had to use one of these yet so thank goodness uh, been able to get it with an endotracheal tube but there are definitely are some cases and so you should feel somewhat proficient with this because you don't want the first time you use it to be in a pinch where you've tried to intubate them for 10 minutes and you couldn't get it so definitely practice with these things uh, this is a mucus suctioning device so um, or sorry meconium aspirator what am i thinking meconium aspirator so very special piece of plastic that uh is invaluable because actually this goes on top of the intratracheal tube suction goes right here this is used like a little carburetor to either to direct the suction down the intratracheal tube so suction is turned on you would intubate with this get to where you need to go cover this hole and withdraw and it's going to draw suction through the whole time it's a good way to pull mucus uh meconium out mucus maybe it could be meconium and mucus together but it's it's a meconium aspirator so it's something really good to have and it's something that's really really easy to lose so i like to kind of stand it up if i can because if you lay it down it's clear and sometimes you're fumbling around and looking for it hopefully you don't have to do that in a pinch so uh, we also over here have uh, entitled CO2. So obviously, uh, since babies are humans, they exhale CO2 just like adults. And a really funny thing, it's in the same concentration because we're measuring um, centimeters of water pressure. So you're measuring the pressure of that coming out. So they will trigger these. Just because it's a low volume doesn't mean it won't trigger it. So we're because we're measuring pressure. So these are really good. I haven't opened this one up yet. But uh, it's really good for verifying your endotracheal tubes, and especially if you have a good spontaneously breathing kid um, that just is um, just needs his airway protected. Uh, it's nice to know that this endotracheal tube's in. It's very easy to miss an intubation on a neonate. And then, uh, of course, we have our pulse oximeter. Always goes right upper extremity. Uh, we always do preductal sats, so right upper extremity every time. This is a nice little wrap, and um, that's also part of our kit. And then up here we have a regular d -Lee suction, not used a whole lot. Um, usually it can be used sometimes to, um, after intubation, to pull some air out of the stomach. Uh, you can pull that up into here if they have any extra retaining amniotic fluid in their stomach, blah, blah, blah. Not super important, but you'll see this on almost every uh, resuscitation kit. And then this is kind of a, just a quick, kind of a generic setup for our umbilical line setup. So. 
Um, in the case of a resuscitation, it's going to be an emergent umbilical line. So as I like to say with an emergent umbilical line, it's essentially like putting in a Foley catheter. So that's uh, about the technique that you use for it. So um, this is just a, a quick little setup for that. It's not a sterile procedure by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so it's a clean procedure hopefully, uh, but it's something you get, you need it in a pinch and then it can be re-secured or changed, however that might be when you get back to the NICU after the resuscitation. So let's move on over to the uh, resuscitator so we can get a good look at uh, how to intubate. Just gonna show you generically and then a little bit of uh, talk about ventilation. So I'm back here at the resuscitator. I have my Neo-T hooked up to the flow meter back there. Obviously we would love to have a blender, but in this case we're just going to use it off the wall because we are in a situation where we do not have a blender. Uh, so you're going to see our Neo-T, we want to set it up with some pressures right off the bat. So the first pressures that you're going to want, just generically we're going to go between 20 and 25 for an inspiratory pressure and 5 for a peep. So let's set it. We include both sides right here. You're going to see a pressure show up. There we go. We're a little bit above 20. So not really where we want to be. We're going to take this dude right here. We're going to adjust it down a little bit. This is our controller to get about 20-ish. So I'm liking that. Check the peep. We're going to keep this end occluded. We're going to look at the peep level. And we're a little bit over 5 there. So let's back it off just a little bit. You can see it changing. So I'm liking that. About 20 over 5. So now we know where that's set up. So there's one aspect of it. The second thing we want to get ready before the baby's born is we want to make sure we get our pulse oximeter ready. So we have our pulse oximeter here, our oximeter cable. We're going to hook it up so there's no fumbling with that uh, during the during the delivery, and then also we're bringing the child over. We don't we want to have this quick close by so we're not looking at open packages and whatnot. So we have our positive pressure. We have our pulse oximeter. We're going to look at, we're going to grab a standard mask. This is an infant mask. I'm going to put it on the end here. Have this ready also. I like to check my pressures without the mask on. You'll see sometimes that we'll put it on here or something like this. I don't think that gives a good seal. So I like to really have this, check the pressures this way, then put the mask on. Now it's ready to go. So I'm not dependent upon, um, you know, having a, a pressure that's off by sealing it, trying to seal it on the bed. So. Other things I might need, of course, we'll need uh, we'll need a towel, uh, some some sterile towels if we have sterile towels. But just because we're gonna warm, dry, and stimulate initially when this child's born, and look for respiration. So check respirations, check for a heart rate. So everything we have is really built around 30 seconds of positive pressure ventilation, and um, so we're gonna need to know when those 30 seconds are up. Um, so that's really important up here on this part. So let me zoom up here a little bit, go up. You can see that is, this is gonna be our timer. So I can turn this timer on if it was plugged in. Oh, gotta turn the power on. Let's get it going here. And this is another thing you'll wanna do. You'll wanna turn the power on it on first because you have this nice light here. We'll turn that on. That's a keypad lock. Not really worried about that as much, but once this is ready, and it's on pre-warm, so it's warming from up here. If you go down to man, down, down to baby, it's actually going to be, it's going to work off the servo unit, which is this right here. So it's going to work off baby's skin temperature. And it's going to adjust this temp by what the baby's skin temp is. So that's what servo is or manual. Right now we're just doing pre-warm, trying to warm the area. Cold babies do not breathe. It's one of the most important things I've ever been taught. So they need to be... Uh, warm, dried, and stimulated, and then continuous warmth coming in because um, they just don't like to breathe when they get cold. So, um, first of all, what I'm going to do from the respiratory therapy side, or even the assist, if I'm going to be like a, a second nurse or, or the person not actually catching the baby or delivering the baby to the resuscitator, I'm going to have this stuff ready. I'm going to check my FiO2. If I have a blender, I'm going to start on room air. Turn my blender to room air. I'm going to check my, check my positive pressure rating. Maybe have a handle and a blade close by with an endotracheal tube close by. My pulse ox ready. And turn this on. We're also going to turn our oxygen on. If you have oxygen on your resuscitator. And then suction too to have that ready. 
those are your biggies that you need uh, before uh, the the child's born. So we come in, get ready, and then after that, I'm just usually waiting. I usually put my hand up here, and I wait till the child comes out, and the baby's born, and I will hit the start button because that is so important to have that timer right here going off because that's everything we do is built around those 30 seconds of positive pressure ventilation. So we really need uh, to have a good timer and to be in time with um, our partners that we're working with. So it's really important to get that. After I feel like I have that, I feel like we can just I can wait here and just and I'm um, ready for the, for the child to be born. If it's an emergent uh, delivery and I don't get a chance to set this up, that's when it gets a little bit more funky because you may be fumbling for some stuff. And you may be setting up pressures on this really, really quick uh, if you have a uh, like a really a spontaneous birth. So it's nice to have a little bit of warning <laughs> so, and get the stuff set up early. It just makes sure everything's there and you're not fumbling over stuff. So um, let me show you a little bit about sealing this mask on and then show a little bit with um, intubation. Another nice aspect that you would have is a little bit of a towel roll. Now, we don't want it too much, and that might be a little bit too much for this guy, but to have a towel roll to be able to get this kid in more of a sniffing position, so a more of a level position here, instead of having his head down like this or back like this, right that level position, that's where his airway is gonna be most open for positive pressure ventilation. So, uh, initially comes over, warm, dry, stimulate. Um, of course, we're gonna suction at the perineum, but they're gonna warm, dry, stimulate, check for a heart rate, looking for respirations. Simulator's not turned on right now, so he has no heart rate. So what we're gonna do in that case is we're gonna start positive pressure ventilation. So I need to do a couple different things real quick. I need to get a good seal, and I need to, to note the time on the resuscitator. So, because I wanna look at 30 seconds from this time to reassess. So we're gonna seal this on. Of course, that's where the nose goes, right there. I'm gonna seal it on, and you're gonna notice a little bit when I seal it on, should get a little bit of a pressure. And you see, uh oh, what's the deal? I'm trying to ventilate and it's not going up to 20. So if, if it's not working that way and you're not seeing chest rise, which you won't because it's not going to 20, you do a couple different things here. You're gonna do what they call Mr. Sopa. So it is an acronym for M-R-S-O-P-A. So M is the mask, is the mask fitting? Do I need to readjust it? So mask and readjust, M-R. So we're gonna put the mask on, we're gonna readjust it a little bit. Sometimes you get, a little funkiness in one of these seals here. So you're gonna readjust the mask. So that's the first thing. Um, and then I, I try to ventilate, not get anything there. The next one is S, so that's suction. So now I can suction the kids. So I can go over, I can do a little bit of suctioning, try to go back, don't wanna go too deep because you'll cause, um, cause them to vasovagal a little bit. So you wanna go back, see if you can get anything out, okay. Try to get a good seal. Try to give a breath, and I'm still not getting the pressures I need. So the next one is O. So um, open the airway. So you can see O for open the airway. This guy's airway is really nice and open, almost constantly. Hey. And uh, so he's got a nice open airway. You kind of adjust the jaw a little bit. I always like to kind of, you can do a little, they got nice little jaws if you can get a hold of them here. But they, they're really cartilaginous, so their jaw moves quite a bit. Um, so you can kind of move it down a little bit. You don't want to dislocate it, but just put a little bit of movement on it. Maybe, maybe the tongue is stuck in a weird position or something. So, O for open the airway. Not get anything there. The next one is P, and that's actually increasing pressure. So we got to go over here, occlude, and crank up the pressure a little bit. So if I get my occlusion here, and let's say I was at 20, I was at 20, and then I go up on my pressure, let's say I go up to about 30. Not super common to do, we can increase the pressure, and I'm still not getting the ventilation. The last thing is, after P is A, so that's artificial airway. So um, that's when we would go to do, use an artificial airway and we're gonna intubate the kid. So we'll do that in just a second. Now, if I was ventilating and I was getting good pressures, one thing I always like to do and I always like to have my eyes totally in line with uh, this kid's chest and my manometer because I want to monitor both of those things at the same time. So if I can get a good shot here, and I might have to go down a little bit, 
But if I'm ventilating this, this kid, if I'm ventilating a kid, I like to have a direct line of sight going straight down through here across this manometer. It's really nice to have a manometer here and then to the kid's chest. So when I'm ventilating, I want to see the corresponding chest rise with the manometer going to the pressure I have set. If I'm using a manometer that's on the back side of the resuscitator, I'm doing the same thing, the direct line of sight. And I think that's really important. And another thing that's really important is to focus in on your ventilations because when you focus in on your ventilations, you're not going to get distracted about other things going on because it's really easy to get distracted. They're throwing out um, heart rates and all kinds of different things and mom's history and mom might be screaming and, and dad might be in the room and mad about something or he's right up, in your, right up close to you taking pictures, which that's fine, but you have to be really focused on this because every time <laughs> you have to give 30 seconds of good positive pressure. If you don't do it, you could be doing chest compressions on a kid that didn't need it because the adequacy of your PPV really dictates how you flow down the algorithm. So you have to have good PPV. If you take, if it takes 20 seconds to get everything lined up and the Mr. Sofa and you get to O and open the airway and it starts filling, you start from right from there, now you do 30 seconds. And then after when those 30 seconds are up, then, then you'll want to reassess. But having that 30 seconds of good positive pressure is really important. You shouldn't be thinking about anything else or drug doses or this or that or umbilical lines and that kind of thing. No, you focused in, block out the rest of the world. You're focused in on doing proper ventilations 40 to 60 times per minute and see an adequate chest rise. And then you see the good response on your manometer. I'll tell you, it's something that's really hard to do and you have to be very, very deliberate with it in the delivery room because if not, you will. And I mean, I think there's a simulation that's that's video recently where I miss a breath because I was I started thinking about some other doses that was thrown out. And I was like, oh, I don't know if that's right. You know, I was thinking about that kind of stuff, and I wasn't focusing on your job. Biggest thing is do your job. So your job in this case is ventilating this kid. So you want to make sure you get good positive pressure ventilation. That straight line of sight I think is really important. Having a good seal on the mask because you don't want to have to do CPR on a kid that doesn't need it. And it's a lot of times, over 95% of the time, you can pull a kid out with good positive pressure ventilation. That's why it's important and that's why uh, there's a whole section that we teach on it. So it's really important to get this down. If you learn nothing else, no positive pressure. If you do really junky positive pressure ventilation, you're gonna end up doing chest compressions and maybe drugs on a kid that didn't need it. So. That's my soapbox on positive pressure ventilation. It's just not this easy. It's not just this. Okay, so there's, all, there's, actually, there's actually a lot to it. So I don't want to, uh, you know, it's definitely not just uh, simply squeezing a bag or including that. It's a vital part of neonatal resuscitation. So let's go over now intubation. So I'm going to put on, um, actually I might upgrade a little bit. I want to show you how to do, do it with a one. So I have a my handle, I have a one blade, which is way too long. And I'll get a close up here. This blade, obviously, if I put that thing in, shoot, that thing is gonna be like all the way down the crine itself. So I'm not gonna bury this thing all the way and shove it around the corner like that. Not good, don't do that. So with all intubations, you only use what you need of this blade. Just because it's this long doesn't mean I have to use it that way. So you only use the tip. And so when you do this, you're going to go in on the right hand side, you're going to sweep the tongue a little bit, and then you're going to lift, and you're going to lift this soft tissue up. Now let me get a little bit different view here. So when you go in, you're going to lift this up like this. And so it's going to think about lifting this soft tissue right here. Think about lifting it upward. You're going to want to go straight up with it. None of this stuff right here, uh, cranking, I don't like cranking, especially if these cases they don't have to, you don't this is not a lever this is not used as a lever like this this is used just to lift the soft tissue up so if anything else it should be all being lift up this direction so the kid won't lift up in most cases um, unless they're really light but usually this area right here is really cartilaginous it's really easy to kind of move and to be able to find that airway 
So what I'm going to do, left hand, I'm going in. So I'm going to go in, not going to bury it, just going to use the tip, go behind the tongue. I'm going to go in and look. I see the epiglottis, which is the little piece of tissue that hangs over top of your trachea. If you see the epiglottis, you're in business because right behind that dude, boom, that's going to be your glottis. So if you see the epiglottis and you're in there and you see, oh, that's the epiglottis, there's a weird piece of tissue sitting right there. And that's what it'll kind of look like. It won't have a thumbnail, a fingernail on it, but it'll look like a piece of tissue. And you just go in and you just do a little flippy do like that. It's going to be right behind it is going to be the glottis and where you want to put the endotracheal tube. So it's really important because we don't do a lot of video uh, intubations, it's really important that the endotracheal tube gets in the right spot. So let me show you a little bit of a view from behind me. So you can see that I have, I'm going to use a 3.5 ET tube here with a stylet in this case. So this is always going to go over here on the right side because when I go in to intubate, I'm going to get the tube over here on the right side to put it in every time. So if you're assisting, you always are on the right side of the patient getting ready to hand in the tracheal tube. When you hand it, don't hand it like this because they may not be looking and you always want to hand it this way so they can have it and go directly in with it because once you view these vocal cords you won't want to take your eyes off of them and I'll show you why. And so you can see I'm going to go back back here and if you look down in there now you can see that dark hole that actually is the, that is the esophagus so that's posterior so when I go back I'm going to want to look anterior to that so you'll see I'll lift and you can just see right there See the base of those vocal cords? You can see the dark hole a little higher and, and the vocal cords. Now this is not exactly what every trachea looks like, but it's a pretty good representation of the amount of pressure you have to do. So if we pull back, you can see I'm putting some pressure, but then I'm also using my pinky. Now this is another little technique that we use, um, that I've seen used. You use your pinky right here as a little bit of cricoid pressure. So this is like next level type stuff. But if you use your pinky as a little cricoid pressure, I'll show you the difference. So if I'm going to go in and take a look, of course, right there, there is a little flap of skin. It's hard to see the epiglottis in this little dude. But if we go here on the other side of it, oh, there it is. So if I push down on it, you can see it there. You see on the other side, if I go around it, and now I lift up, and I look back in, I'm going to see. My cords there. So you can see vocal cords. Now watch, if I put a little pressure on my pinky, it does bring it down a little bit more in view, and that's just a little bit of pressure. Just makes it stick out a little bit more, so that helps to use your pinky there a little bit. So let's go in and we're going to intubate this child. So, so you're going to see that I'm going to go in. I'm going to initially view. I see the epiglottis. I'm going to move it out of the way. I'm going to lift. I can see the cords. Could add a little more pressure. I'm going to keep my eye on the cords while my assistant hands me the endotracheal tube. At that time, I'm going to insert it from the side. And I'm going to watch as that endotracheal tube goes through the vocal cords. So at that point, it's through the vocal cords. I'll withdraw the blade. Still securing the tube right here. I'm going to remove the stylet. And I'm going to secure the tube to the top of the mouth. And that's really the best thing to do. A lot of people will grab it here. It has a tendency to slide. Securing it to the top of the mouth until you can get it taped is really important. Because that this one finger securing it really helps a lot. Uh, to keep it from moving up and down a lot. Now, if you want to see that it's in the right spot, you can go in and view. A lot in the mouth down there. You can see that you can see stomach down there, and then you can see if I go in and I lift, you can see there it is through the vocal cords. You can see the endotracheal tube in the right spot. So you wouldn't check it like that, but the next thing that you would do is you would have it secured pop off the mask, adapt this, and now when I give it, it's going up to the high pressure I set because remember I went through Mr. Sopa, added the extra pressure, 
and now it's sealing. So really we needed to get to the A on Mr. Sopa to get a good seal on this kid. So ideally I probably would go occlude those, back this down just a little bit. Really cool, so if I just adapt it to it, you see it goes straight to five. Now we're ventilating. So uh, secure that tube and ventilate your kid at 20 over five. So now you have a good ET tube. One other aspect of course is XL CO2. So even if you saw it go through the cords, it's nice to put your XL CO2 on here. Pull this tab out. When I pull the tab out, it then allows it to uh, this this film in here to change if it's in the presence of CO2. So if I see this and I see, oh look, there's no change. That's not good. That means there's no XL CO2. It should be changing yellow. What it should look like is this. Really the best way to demonstrate this is just to show you how it changes when it gets exhaled air coming back through it. So there it is on the end of the ET tube. Right now it is very blue. And you can see it turned yellow in the presence of at least 5% carbon dioxide. So that's what you're gonna see. You're looking for yellow in 5%. Uh, it will change a little greenish if it's one to two. You really like it to be 5%. So there's blue. There's your change. That's another great indicator that it's in the trachea because even after two breaths, you should not be turning yellow if you're in the stomach. Okay, very rarely will it turn yellow in the stomach, but after two breaths, it will not. The percentage is ultra low. So uh, way lower than what it would take to change this. So having that, uh, the visualizing it through the cords is really important. Another one is exhale CO2 is really important. And a third one is you get a good chest rise. And then also you should start to see your heart rate increase because you did everything you needed, M-R-S-O-P-A. And now you should start seeing um, uh, visual chest rise for one, but then your heart rate should react to that. So if you had a low heart rate, it should start increasing. If not, you've got other issues that move you farther down the algorithm. But as far as airway goes, that's as far as it gets. If you can, in, if you can intubate a neonate in these cases, uh, it's that's a, that's really really good. You're at a really good point uh, because there's a lot of other stuff you can do. But having a secure airway with adequate chest rise and good ventilation is extremely, extremely important. So um, another thing, another little thing that we kind of use, and I'll go back over here just to show you how this works, is uh, another little trick that we might use when trying to initially insert that laryngoscope into their mouth. So before I insert my blade, which this blade's really kind of big for this kid, but I'm just gonna use the front part of it. A zero is probably optimal. Um, before we do that, this oral pharynx back here, especially from this kid's been in amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid, if you don't know, is extremely slippery. And when you do this, and I, I'm not exaggerating when you do this, when you put this back in here, it will go like this. There will be hard to keep control of it because it is so slippery. So one thing we commonly do is take a two by two gauze and we push it down, of course a gloved hand, just kind of do a quick wipe off of the tongue and it gives you a little bit more grip when it goes to lifting up this airway because you are working with fractions of a centimeter. And if you move much at all, you won't be able to see that trachea. So being able to have a piece of gauze, doing a quick wipe on the tongue, and then going for it is really important. So having a two by two gauze is really nice. Another nice thing to add to your resuscitator or your kit if, right before you intubate so you can get that stuff ready. I hope you guys learned something today from this demonstration on the neonate about taking care of the airway. And like I said before, positive pressure ventilation is so important. So practicing before you have to do it clinically is vital. So I really recommend if you haven't used your Neo-T for a while or you haven't used T-PET, piece resuscitation, 
to get it out every month. Practice changing those pressures. Maybe put it on a test long so you can see you know, the rebound from the test long when you, when you have appropriate seal. And then also if you have the opportunity to go to a simulation center, that's a really nice thing also. Of course, neonatal intubation should not be tried by anybody who is not properly trained in it. This is not like watch the Jimmy's video and then go intubate a baby. It's nothing like that because it takes a lot of uh, time and work and actually perfecting it in the adult world before you come over to the neonatal world. So uh, it's something that shouldn't be taken very lightly and it's an extremely important part of neonatal resuscitation. Um, so uh, big keys, of course, positive pressure ventilation, having that good seal, the Mr. Sopa, and then selecting that endotracheal tube appropriately, wiping off the back of the tongue, going in, visualizing, inserting it, verifying it within tidal CO2. Those are all different aspects that you can work on in practice before you have to use it in a real life scenario because if you're the airway person your job is vitally important in a neonatal resuscitation so I really appreciate you watching make sure you like and subscribe to the RT clinic I've got a lot of other videos and I've also linked the other videos from the Rural Health Innovation Collaborative in the uh, in my playlist for this one so in the playlist you'll also see some other videos from this neonatal outreach program and uh, Watch them, comment on them, share them with your friends, subscribe to the RHIC, the Rural Health Innovation Collaborative, and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Later.